Okay, thank you all for joining us. Um, we are the C. Grimaldus Gallery. Um, we are the longest uh, continually operating gallery in Baltimore. We opened in 1977 with a focus on local and regional artists, encouraging a spirit of exploration and experimentation. Within just a few years, owner Constantine Grimaldus began to exhibit important international artists, beginning with Grace Hardigan, Elaine de Kooning, Alice Neal, and Anne Truitt, and Sir Anthony Caro. Continually developing a distinct curatorial viewpoint, the gallery maintained its commitment to emerging and mid-career artists while simultaneously developing relationships with many of the major names of the day, including John Baldessari, Willem de Kooning, Robert Rauschenberg, Richard Serra, and John Waters. Focusing on a selective roster, the gallery promoted younger artists like Chulhanan, Beverly McKeever, um, and our guests today, Jay Coe and John Rupert, exhibiting their work along with more well-known artists oh, in both the regular gallery program and um, at international art fairs in the United States and Europe. So currently on view at our gallery here is our 43rd annual group exhibition Summer 20, featuring 14 contemporary artists working in painting, drawing, collage, sculpture, and photography. Art, uh, today, we are delighted to be joined um, by two of our exhibiting artists, Jay Coe and John Rupert, as well as our moderator, Kristen Heilman. Our conversation today will center on the art of creating extensive visual vernaculars through process-based studio practices and an inspiration from natural forms. Um, I'd like to take a quick moment to introduce and extend a big thank you to our visiting moderator, Kristen Heilman. Kristen is an independent curator and consultant who works to realize inspiring and relevant projects by artists at all stages in their careers who address the contemporary human condition. Kristen is a graduate of American University and the University of Maryland College Park and has become a pillar in the Baltimore Washington arts community. She has spent nearly two decades working as a curator and um, first at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, DC, and more recently as head of the contemporary department at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Kristen is currently the curator in residence at the Delaware Contemporary. So thank you very much, Kristen, for joining us. Um, we will start uh, with some brief introductions into the work of our two artists, um, and then we'll move to a guided conversation with some time for our audience questions. Um, and rather than take up our dialogue time by reading all of the impressive bios of our visitors, I'll post them in the chat after their introductions. Um, Viewers, you can also use the chat to post questions along the way. Um, I will keep track of those questions and moderate them um, at the end of our guided conversation. Um, all right, so without further ado, I am going to share my screen and we'll start with an introduction into the work of Jay Crow. Yeah. All right. Where should we get pizza? <laughs> <laughs> um, audience members, if you could please mute yourselves. Jayco, take it away. Is Jay there? I'm here. You're here? All right, whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, uh, I just uh, briefly introduced myself. Uh, I'm Rico. As you know, I'm an artist. And now we're going to tell you a little bit of my background. I was born and raised in Korea. 
and late teenage, I moved to Japan and studied graphic design, fashion, and contemporary art about nine years. And then I moved to America uh, 1988 and for study art. And ever since I'm here, uh, still living here. Uh, I went to school in uh, Maika, 1990, 1980, I'm sorry, I, I cannot track the year, 1946, 1998, uh, Mount Royal, and uh, ever since, I am uh, being full-time artist at the studio. So there are some images showing, uh, it is at the Gomoldas Gallery show right now. And let me just go briefly what I use. Uh, I've been working with paper since I don't remember. And all materials are based on recycled paper. And what you are seeing here is a red adding machine tape, which is cash register roll. And I've been using cash register roll since I was in graduate school. And before that, I used more like a rice paper when I was in Asia, made a uh, installation for that. And when I moved here, I became more industrialized paper, which is uh, not really pure paper. No, I don't wanna use those. So I pick up the more like a common uh, uh, everyday material, like adding machine tape. It's, which is, this is catch register roll. When you buy stuff, you get receipt paper. And I use other, like a craft paper roll. And that, that is more like insulation. Uh, comes with white, brown, and some papers are black. And one you, uh, you are seeing here is adding machine tape. And this is very earlier work, not that early, 2008. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty big 60s compared to what I did 60 you know 2008 uh, 67 inches tall so I did this one in 2008 and ever since I do uh, work with few different series of work with same kind of paper which is this is also adding machine tape but the other work you've seen the, the, those papers are more like uh, working with paper, with water. And this twisted series are just twisted. And until paper doesn't want to be twisted. And the other work are soaking in the water until paper doesn't absorb water anymore. So there's two, a few different kind of technique I'm working with this series. And conceptual or idea behind of these works are more like, uh, you know, inspirations. I go and see and, you know, feel it. And then, and then after that, it stays in my mind and comes out. And this too, you are seeing, I did it when I was in graduate school, uh, 48 by uh, three, 48 by 48 pieces, one piece. And then some reason I show it at the Arlington Art Center with Kristen. And some reason I stopped working this series. And this is also adding machine tape. And you see this uh, plastic thing right in the middle. And I cut it with saw and dip it in the water and paper get very smooth and easy to handle it and put it on the panel with a pull of glue on it. And uh, some reason I stopped working this because I don't know why. And then I got, I went back to my storage and the work was there. I took it out and changed it, it was black and uh, changed it with blue, ultramarine blue. And I really liked it. So I keep working few pieces like this. And uh, this is other work I'm doing it. So basically I have four or five different kind of technique I'm working with paper. It's all roll paper, it's all recycled paper. I get to, you know, ask the people, how this recycled paper is gonna hold how long? 
And uh, actually, I don't know, but 1996, the first piece I made, my collector still has it and still love it and nothing happens. So I, I guess, you know, using recycled materials are not a bad thing. It's much more environment friendly. That's what I like about. And uh, the, place, the places we drive, it's very extreme. And all of those images, you know, views and things, you know, put it in my mind and then put it aside and idea idea is in my mind not you know those pictures i took it i don't usually take a picture but sometimes people want to know where you go and what's the idea what you know something like that so this amazing landscape this is you know what i want to see what i want to inspire so after that i came back and do more insulation with this or just making some wall, you know, home sculpture or floor uh, sculptures. So this is my inspiration, inspiration, I'm sorry. So uh, when you go back to uh, the last one, next of this image, I have some, yeah, this is another installation. This is just regular brown craft paper roll. You can get it from Home Depot when you want to wrap it. It's nothing very special, but when you see those material very carefully, it could be more than what it is it wants to be something else than what you see you know at the regular places that's so those are insulation uh at the this one i did it at the you know, first time i did it in china i never shown my work in in asia since i moved here so some reason they call me to do insulation at the shanghai the times art museum so i uh Put this insulation in the wall and uh, first time shown at the Asia. So the next one is Contemporary Art Museum Houston before this and uh, working with floor piece and the floor piece stays uh, their own uh, balance. So it's very, if you kick it, it just collapses, and that's okay with me because it has to be, it wants to sit the way it wants to be sit so that is floor insulation goes with wall. What's next? Yeah, this is wall insulation goes with floor. And uh, the wall installation, I have to fasten individual roll with brackets and things, things like that push really hard so it doesn't move, it doesn't settle down. So I don't want to see the gap. So. I, that process, that process just makes me so tired. So I just roll the paper and just put it on the floor and make their own shape. So it's, uh, it's enforced versus not just their own way of sitting and showing. So studio uh, work, I do play with paper a lot, many different shapes rolled it, unroll it, or twist it, or just do what paper wants to be. So as you see, there's a paper towel right next to it. So I do, this is one of those work I really like to do it, but I don't know how to hold it. And I don't have to hold it because this is my sketches and ideas. So this is my work. Are we done with slide? Yes, thank, okay. you. thank you so much for sharing with us. You can see behind me in the gallery, a few of your pieces are hanging. So it's great to go through these slides with you. Um, John, would you like to speak a little bit about your work? Okay. So as you're gonna see, um, my work is inspired by nature and the landscape and uh, not only um, the beauty of the landscape, but also the evidence or how the landscape became what it is what you're looking at. So the places like the coast of Maine or uh, the deserts out in our west and also maybe the uh, living landscape of Iceland. Uh, um, the, this series are these uh, split rocks where I'll take a, a, a rock and make a copy of that rock and then put the copy next to the rock and then you compare 
the two, you know, the industrial object versus the natural object. And also each metal has their own uh, language. So this piece here is copper, uh, bronze, aluminum, iron, and granite. Um, so what they reveal is uh, this kind of nature in industry. And so that all these castings have a mark of my hand and the industrial process. This is part of the lightning strike series where I gather uh, fragments of trees that have been hit by lightning and then uh, cast them in different metals, iron, aluminum, uh, stainless steel, bronze. And in this case, the base was actually the pouring cup, so the piece was poured upside down. This is, this is a, a much larger piece. Uh, this mm -hmm. is from a cherry tree. It was struck and reassembled upside down in iron. It's about 20 feet tall. Um, this is another bronze strike. It's more of an, uh, a fragmented element, so it's taking the strike and then continuing the deconstruction of the object, cast in bronze. And, and these are a pair, a set of four different metals, uh, bronze, stainless steel, copper, and iron. So I see the uh, casting process as a metaphor to the uh, volcanic activity of, that has created the earth. So it's this kind of connection to molten metal and lava and creation. This is aluminum. This is a uh, glacier boulder from Maine and a strike from Maine. So then brought the two together. This is an iron strike in relationship to the iron boulder, or the granite boulder. This is cast salt. So that I melted rock salt and then poured it into a, a form um, and then hewn the tip of it. And the, the surface is all natural from the process and the residue from the, from the uh, mold itself. So it's like a graphite skin on the cast salt. Another part of my work is working with um, chain link fence. And I, I see the chain, as the castings are kind of taken from nature, the uh, chain link fence objects are put into landscape as a, as a monitor to the landscape. So it's not only an object, but it also makes you more aware of your surroundings and you can see through them and, and the lighting of the day changes and the sculpture changes with the light. Um, and they kind of talk about the terrain and overlaps as you walk through the landscape. This is vortex. So this is taking that spherical form and then uh, more warping it into another object. This, these are uh, vines, bittersweet vines that are invasive species that I've been, uh, they, they're all up and down 83 and I've taken them and started creating three-dimensional drawings by hooking them together with uh, plumbing fixtures and creating uh, spaces. This is magnetite. It's a um, material that comes from volcanoes uh, it's atomized iron, so when the, the uh, lava hits the ocean, it fragments. And, and then over time, because of the specific gravity of the material, it gets in layers. Mm -hmm. Then you can take it, it's also magnetic. And th these are objects in reference to celestial events. This is from a, a project, and th these are including the uh, vines and uh, glacier calving projections on the wall. This is a bigger overview of the exhibition. There's a culmination of several years of work uh, where it brings all the different aspects of my work together. Hey, Cole, on Zoom here. I just got in myself. 
Um, this is a, from a series that's been going on for about 12, 15 years of uh, casting these ingots. Each one is around a thousand pounds of iron and the shape is determined by the angle of the mold and, and the openness of the mold. And uh, so each one has its own characteristic and then they're brought back together in, in an arrangement. Referencing volcanic. I go on several uh, residencies and do, a, and when I'm on a residency, I'll usually do photography. So this is from a recent trip to the Arctic and this is printed on uh, aluminum. So a lot of my photographs have a kind of sculptural presence to them and, and re in relationship to the imagery. So I wanted to talk about the reflective quality of the water. And so the, the actual reflection is metal. So it's an image on the metal. So the two come together. There's another Arctic image. And then uh, this is a, whoop. <laughs> this is a, a most recent casting of aluminum uh, uh, from a uh, black Vermont rock, but it also references uh, iceberg. So it's this kind of ghost image reference. The, uh, the copy is, of course, the, the um, black slate. So, you know, hopefully uh, from my work, people will, um, I guess uh, it'll remind them of how fragile our existence is on the earth and, and also how lucky we are uh, in our positioning in the universe, spinning around the sun on a ball of iron and we're yeah. still here. So. Great, thank you so much, John, for that introduction. Um, as a reminder now, if you have questions, you're welcome to post them in the chat. We will try to address as many as possible um, as we move through this talk. But for now, I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen for some of her questions. Thanks, Julia. And thanks to both you and Costas for having me here tonight. And it's good to, to be with this whole group, which includes so many friends and also my mother, who through the magic of Zoom is joining us from Chicago. So hi, mom. Um, as I, th I think we've, all, we've just heard, uh, both John and Jay um, are very engaged with the materials that they use in their work. And so I wanted to probe that subject a little bit further, starting with Jay. And um, Jay, you know, you mentioned that first show that we worked on together at the Arlington Art Center, which was uh, for those who have been in the area a while, they might remember it was part of Art Sites 98, I think, um, which was a project that the Corcoran, on, when Sammy Hoy was at the Corcoran, in fact, and when there was a Corcoran, <laughs> uh, organized with local art centers. And I remember um, being so excited about your work and you know, excited to have this artist who was doing great things with paper at the art center. And in you walked uh, to install your work with these three massive uh, panels for the triptych that you were talking about. And you had all this paper and it was encased in these metal frames. And I had, this was an early point in my curatorial career and I had this revelation that was like, oh my gosh, paper is not a light material and this thing may well fall through the floor of the art center before this exhibition is over. So um, I'm interested to know if in your career there was ever a moment you were using paper in a more conventional way, you know, thinking through its sort of light, eph ephemeral kind of character and when you made the transition into using paper um, in this way that has a lot of physical force and presence and on weight in your sculpture. Yeah, the first of all, I don't usually work with very light material, as you know, and I like to have artwork, it has some kind of weight on it. I don't know what it is and I like that concept. Well, as we know, the paper is, you know, everyday material in our life. But uh, when you try to work with it, it is very unforgiving material. It's a hard and rough and heavy. 
So I learned from all of those, you know, character of paper and do some research, experimental work, and, you know, just keep working over and over until I get to the point, maybe I can work this way with this technique. So as you know, my tool is paper mm -hmm. with water, very beginning of it. And uh, the paper itself, as I mentioned that you know, earlier, it doesn't want to be treated that way. It doesn't want to be, you know, very few people, paper, you don't want to get wet anyway, right? So in that concept, why not? We have to try, but some reason I always stuck with paper because I grew up with paper, like as we all did. And uh, especially me, the paper um, in Asia, I used to work with rice paper a lot. And, uh, you know, like a writing, or even though when I was in Japan, I did make a gigantic insulation, but it was very light. It was like a fuzzy, fuzzy kind of rice paper, and I stack it, flo stack it flo floor to ceiling. It was very light, and then I tap it and just fall, and then slide it out of the shape and make their own, like, you know, each pages. And I did like, like that concept a lot, but some reason those lightweight doesn't really do that much for me. So when I was in graduate school, you know, I started to work. And I had a big absence of 88 through 96 until I get to the graduate school. When I get to the America, like in 88 through 96, big hole, I didn't do it that much. It was very difficult for me to adjust myself in America compared to Japan because I was older or language problem. So I went back to school and uh, it was that absence of, you know, eight years of a big hole, I kind of lost, you know, the track. So I walk around, visited, you know, art store, nothing really interested. And then, you know, so office supply, you know, place like that, I do go there and start to look paper. I don't know why. <laughs> so I got those editing machine tape. It's a uh, cheap enough to buy bunch of it when I was in school. It was very cheap, but now it's very expensive because nobody really wants to use paper anymore. There's no such a thing like a receipt this day and age. But anyway, it's, a, it's a cheap enough to try over and over and over with paper. So now I told Kristen about my, you know, craziness of take gigantic roll of paper to the uh, Ocean City during the winter and then buried under the sand and I have to run because I don't have permit to polluting ocean. <laughs> so then I came back after high tide and paper disappeared, but paper was sitting way, way away from where I buried. But at the same time, the paper moved it by nature force and waves and things like that. And it opens and rip it opens like amazingly, you know, you cannot imagine that you cannot get anything better than that shape. So what nature made, and um, I am causing that nature, but we work together. So bring it into my studio. So I got gigantic kids plastic swimming pool. So I roll the paper and start to dump whole thing after I rolled it and then just wait what paper is gonna react. And then I was like, oh my goodness, maybe I can't work with this because paper rises it by itself the way I roll it, the very beginning of it, of course, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe it's just going to disappear. So that's, uh, that's how, the, how did I start with paper. So ever since, I'm still working with paper, Christian. It's uh, still heavy, <laughs> but uh, I can manage it. You know, the previous one, I worked part, like a four part instead of, you know, big gigantic one. But as you see, back Back there, Christian, that's the same size, 48 by 48, close to it, but that's a base color. And some reason I am going back and forth what I did because I haven't quite finished yet. So 
here I am. Did I answer your question? You did. Yeah, you did. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I think it's amazing how you've explored so many different aspects uh, using, keep returning, while well, you keep returning to the same material. And also how culturally our relationship to paper has changed over the, the time that you've engaged with it as a material. Um, and it is striking to me, I mean, to, to shift to John, that both you and John really engage with this the sense of weight and physicality, which I, to me is one of the fundamental aspects of being a sculptor, is dealing with space and with dealing with the weight of your materials. So John, um, I'm curious, I mean, just as sort of a kind of a cheeky question, I'm very curious to know what the heaviest piece you've ever made is, but um, to take that into a little bit more uh, greater depth, you know, how, how did you come to your materials and you know when was the first time that you took something from the natural world and then paired it with something that you cast which seems to be an ongoing um way that you engage with materials in your work well i i started out as a jeweler <laughs> so i i uh was at school and uh, was looking for, uh, uh, they, they didn't have a very good sculpture program, but they had a great jewelry department. So I started taking jewelry classes and what, what really intrigued me was that transformation of material, um, you know, fire, melting metals, it was almost like alchemy in a way. And so I got really involved with that aspect of transforming materials and as I went along uh, when I think back at my jewelry it had a lot of natural kind of spontaneous dripping and and process in it uh, but then I went on to uh, graduate school and then I, I worked with uh, Albert Paley he's, he's he does ornamental iron work and uh, I got into forging and that scaled up my my work and and but it, it also brought fire into the mix. So I've always seemed to enjoy working with fire because of its transformative nature. Um, so going on, I uh, got interested in larger scale casting and, and did a lot of like ingot-like forms that were uh, like the presence of the material coming from the furnace to our atmosphere and uh, influenced by Richard Serra and, and that kind of presence of mass and material. Then I got uh, thinking about giving an image to the casting of sorts and, and started thinking more about events. And that's where the cast rocks came in and the lightning strikes and various objects and also pumpkins. <laughs> uh, I, I took a, a prized pumpkin and cast that and just because of its fertility and the, and the grandness of it and the freakiness of it too. Um, so the, uh, the idea of, became comparing industry with nature uh, and also finding the nature and industry. And so the two of them uh, brought together and actually set up a dialogue where you start to question what's real and what's not. So that the rock actually looks like styrofoam with the casting looks much tougher. And so, oh. <laughs> um, there's a funny image there. Uh, anything, I, I guess that answered the question or is there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, but I am, I mean, I asked it, oh, the way it in a thing. cheeky way, like, but how, how big have you gone? Like how much weight have you dealt with? And, oh. how, and I guess, how did you do it? I mean, is this sort of studio work or work that happens outside of the studio? Well, you know, I do most of my, my own casting. Uh, and so, but I do have relationships with foundries where they'll let me bring a mold in and they'll pour it for me, which is really, special. Uh, I have a crane truck, so that gets me into bigger trouble. I can, I can, uh, the molds themselves for these castings, like the last casting that I showed in the slides, that mold was over a ton of sand. Uh, it's a piece mold, it's all comes together, it's all sand. Uh, in terms of a casting, that you know, it's, it's in the tonnage, there are probably two tons of a casting. The one that was 
uh, a, a lightning strike that was of the cherry tree. It's several elements that are welded together. Um, but I pretty much work within the means of my truck and that kind of keeps me in a zone. Um, Thank you. Well, and so um, to follow up with both of you, and I guess I'll, I'll continue with John first and then go to Jay. Um, you know, when you are sort of dealing with um, such a quantity of material and such a, again, the word physicality comes up with something that's so physical, it strikes me that there must be a great deal of control that you are sort of asserting on the process and the materials and yet at the same time, I know that, you know, just to sort of go into it in a little bit more detail, this, these lightning strike pieces that you're talking about are, um, are cast from trees that have been found that have been struck by lightning. So it's a very sort of chance occurrence in some ways. I mean, to be struck by lightning, you know, what are the chances of that? And um, the piece that we saw where we saw the vines kind of connected with, um, piping i mean that too is sort of you turning to nature and organic forms that you find and i'd like you to tell us where you find those forms but so this question really boils down to how you navigate sort of these chance encounters with the natural world and then the control you assert either on the materials or your your process to sort of trans to, to finalize that transformation into art well i i do use uh a lot of limit limitations uh so with so that the, the process can then speak so it's almost like a dialogue um with the mold making uh that you'll build a puzzle like form around an object and then there's this area where the molds come together that flashing happens uh then there might even be burn in or there's certain things that happen from that process and then after the mold is opened, uh, then I edit the final object and either leave or keep some of that evidence of that process and that. And, and so with, with the chain link pieces, I'll kind of anticipate, do math to figure out well, how much material I'm going to need and then, then let it behave. And so the rings and the height and the length and all those things are the kind of the parameters. And then the sh final shape is actually determined by gravity. And, and so there's this kind of play back and forth with the medium and, and, my, and how I might anticipate what happens. But that's kind of why I like to, to work, is to kind of set things up and see, see what surprises come out of it. Yeah. Great, thank you. So, and, and Jay, I mean, we heard a little bit about how, um, you hand over some of the making to the force of water, you know, whether it's that sort of first experimental work on the beach or the water you bring into your studio. So, I mean, over time, having made so many of these pieces, can you, how much control now can you um, assert onto this interface of, of the water and paper? And I'm also interested in how, um, color in your work because there's sort of some amazingly rich and vibrant hues that you bring to the, to the work as well as these really lush blacks like is is color a way that um you're kind of controlling the otherwise sort of chance processes behind the sculpture yeah it's uh, my internet connection is not really working very well, but I hope you can hear me well. <laughs> okay, well, uh, my studio is uh, middle of nowhere at the Chesapeake Bay, and uh, so internet could be problem here. Um, you know, oftentimes I rely on material, which it makes a shape for me. As I uh, said, very beginning of it, I totally rely on the shape when I dip it in the water, but now I can control more bec uh, because I've been doing this over 20 years and I can control more and more by my memory or experimental, you know, things and controlling. So I can, I could control more than before. And, and uh, the color you said, I've been working with black 
really long time, more like a Sumi ink, uh, because paper connection between paper and Sumi ink, the route, the route of two materials are pretty much from same one sources. It's paper, wood, and the Sumi ink is a burn the tree to make a ink with ashes and add something more than ashes, but the source are pretty much the same. So I was interested between those two material, uh, production was, you know, the end of whatever you get on your table. It's a different, but it's a one same sources, but they're totally different way of working or using or whatever. So I was very interested on in that concept. So my work was black about 10 years and uh, it became, okay, maybe I can use more than black. I mean, so I was research some color, my identity of color, you know, I'm Korean and I le left Korea for a long time ago. And I wasn't very focused on my inner you know, root before. So when time passed, which means we're getting aged, you can go back and salmon, they're always going back to where they're born, right? So I check it out and then I saw this very, very bright, you know, like a red, yellow and blue kind of my almost identity kind of color. My cultural background color was those bright color. Red gives you luck and blue gives you uh, something else, yellow, and they all have their own meaning in Asia. So uh, I choose the color I don't usually use, which is red for quite a while. And then it became blue because the blue is the time I, in the place I we travel like, you know, John mentioned the glacier and things like that. When, when I get there, there's a blue. You cannot even explain what kind of blue is that. It's so rich and so struck me. And the reason I have to go and see glacier is I was interested to put in insulation. And at the same time, I got amazing blues. So I am thinking about using that blue, but it doesn't really come exactly the glacier deep blue. So I got some other ultramarine kind of blue. Uh, that's what I'm using right now, connected with my insulation uh, force of nature, so. Great, thank you. Well, and that brings up another topic um, that I wanted to, to cover, which is the influence of um, different places on your work uh, and on John's work too. So. You know, we think you you've spent some time talking to us about how growing up in Korea and studying in Japan has have influenced your work, and now we sort of hear that the blue is coming from the experience of visiting uh, Glacier. And in your slides, we saw an image of um, the American West, where you've you've traveled by car quite extensively. So, I mean, is this a consistent um, thing in your work that? that you're at when you can i mean of course we're all sort of housebound right now but when you can you go out and you go to different places that um influence the work and if if that's so is there a place that you haven't been that you're sort of very eager to go to um because of something about the place that will speak to you as an artist yeah uh the place i really want to go and see it's uh, where is lava really uh hot it's really coming out of, you know, that moment. I just want to see that moment lava flow because um, as I mentioned that earlier, I my, you know, the concept of this installation are all like, you know, title force of nature and subtitle is flow, Escalante and Shiro and all of those. So I, I've been searching for more, uh, like a bigger installation with black paper, but it's very hard to get it. But anyway, that's another story. So I wanna see lava flow um, anywhere I can see, either after lava flow and all, they're all formed. And that's what I'm interested to see and get inspiration from there. And then I wanna see more glacier and I wanna sit there and uh, I wanna hear the sound. I wanna hear the whole thing and 
experienced this America, uh, amazing nature. And I also want to see very dry land again. So I go back same places. We went there over and over and over. But every time I go there, it looked like a new to me because nature is very moving and nature is very, you know, unforgiving also. So I just want to more like a feel the, feel the world. And I don't exactly know where, but there are so many places I've never been there. And uh, I want to be there before my knee went out. <laughs> some remote kind of places and then you know beautiful places like you know someplace else i can take a cruise later on after 70s <laughs> so i want to go very uh, you know to north and try it and those places i am very interested thank you thanks it's interesting to me that you you want to return to see very dry land again or you and that you want to see lava flow like um, these places that are in some ways elementally very different from like the water that sort of fills your work and you know also I know your studio is surrounded by water so right. I mean it seems right. that you want to um, kind of experience the full elemental range of of what the earth can do yes that's uh, that's what I really like to you know see I mean that's what I really want to be and my work is, you know, I don't put that much flair behind my work, but I just want people to see how delicate this, this nature is. They're very delicate, you know. So through, you know, John's work and my work, it's a very much like, you know, nature based on. So as I mentioned, as I told you, I don't put that much flair on it, but definitely we have to take care where we live, you know, like in out west, it's like a burning, it's heartbreaking right now. So those are all kind of part of, you know, our life, but we could take care of it better than this, so. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and so John, you know, you too, I think travel and experiencing different landscapes is, is quite important. And I know you've been to some, fairly extreme kinds of places. And, you know, the same question goes, where, where else would you want to visit? But also, you know, how has the experience of your past travels um, come to affect, not just the imagery, but the processes behind your work? Yeah, I, I'm similar to Jay. I, I, I'm interested in the very extreme environments. Um, and, and on my list is Hawaii to, to experience that lava, the live lava and the, uh, the remnants of volcanic activity. And also um, Australia and the vast landscape there and the, and the deserts and the culture. Um, and one, one of the constants, though, for me has been Maine, uh, my family, and I've been going up almost every year for at least two, one or two weeks out of the year. I go to the same place. So there's that kind of cycle and re-seeing. Re I'll go up with different materials and re reinterpret what I've experienced each time through photography, drawing, I draw with mud or sound video so each time i'll go up there i'll i'll see the environment in a different way and that and then i pretty much collect uh, like sampling in a way and then those samples may percolate up in my work later on so like the the exhibition i had at umbc empirical evidence has some of that in it where some of the things that i had collected when i'm traveling are brought back into the environment. Uh, so there's sound, um, video, and then um, also in that exhibition, I had uh, the uh, data coming from the USGS monitoring system that's listening to the earth. And so I was able to bring that into the gallery and make it evident through both a monitor and also I energized one of the boulders each time there was a volcano or earthquake 
Um, so I'm just really, um, the, the way those travels come into the work is, is really kind of subconscious. And I'm not, I don't know if directly it'll affect or not, but it will percolate into the work eventually. So I have kind of a library of all different media and things. Well, you know, I find um, this sort of sense of ecology that both of you are, are talking about. I mean, it becomes a very palpable thing when you're standing in front of your works. And John, you mentioned the the piece you you had at UMBC that um, you know ha one could sort of experience the size the seismic activity of the Earth as you're standing in the gallery, and I, that made me feel very. Um, you know, very incidental to something that was is very big, uh, which is, I think, a really important perspective to have. Um, and I guess I want I want to ask both you and Jay this question about um, time in a very conceptual way. And I realize I did not ask you this question in advance, so this is like a new one that I'm throwing at you that we didn't prepare for. But you know, and even Jay's comment about the the fires in the West that we're contending with now, it feels like, you know, both in terms of the urgency of what's going on with um, with the earth and sort of its ecology, coupled with, you know, the experience of this pandemic, kind of the onslaught of it so quickly. And then on top of it all, the media cycle that we're living in and the political times we're living in, it's like, everything feels quite accelerated. But I think, both of you have this quality in your work that speaks to a larger sense of time, this larger sense of scale, this larger sense of perspective. I mean, uh, with you, John, it, it seems to have very much to do with like a geological expanse of time. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, both about whether that f resonates with you, that time is sort of something that you're thinking about in your, in your work. And also if you feel a little bit of, um, a, a rupture, sort of a disjuncture between the kind of time you're dealing with in your art and the pace of time that we're experiencing just being alive right now in 2020. Well, I mean, um, I, I think of time where we're, we're really insignificant in, in terms of time, you know, and that we're, we're this little blip <laughs> of a moment. And Sure, I think we're having a big impact on on the Earth with the uh, ever since humans have been on Earth and have been causing all kinds of um, ecological disasters. Um, but eventually, you know, the the Earth will carry on. You know, there'll be certain effects from what we do, but the Earth will be fine. But it'll be different. But it'll be fine. You know, it'll carry on. Um, and so we may not experience how it's going to carry on, uh, and then something else will evolve. So I really see us as very in insignificant in a way. Um, and, you know, I, when I was a kid around 12, I lived in the Middle East with my parents. We lived in Jordan and uh, got involved with archaeology. So as a, as a kid, I... I was digging around in the in, in, in ruins and finding these artifacts from from a culture of the past, and, and I guess it was an early introduction into this idea about human existence, time, and the, the remnants of human activity and civilization, and also the uh, the architecture. You come to a ruin, and these buildings are built from the materials of the landscape, and then they're organized and then they've been collapsed or torn down and there's this combination of human order and natural order and so those kinds of things that i experienced I, you know when i was 12 i wasn't internalizing it that way but i think it had an effect on the way i see things and work thank you thank you and and jay i mean i kind of bring the same question to you. I, when I think about your work, I think about a very time intensive process. You know, I, I don't think there's anything quick about the way that you work. 
And so, you know, I mean, how do you think about time, both in the way you're making work and how it manifests in the way that someone might experience the work? And, and is it hard to be making work that is so meditative and labor intensive at a moment in our culture where things happen so, so quickly? Well, my work is, you know, everybody's work is pretty much the same. It's an it's obsession of what you're doing. I have the same routine over and over at a small spool of editing machine tape. I have unroll and re-roll, you know, let it, until I get the shape. So that process, you have to put, your, put yourself into some other place. It's, it's more labor intense, but it's, 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 it's something to do with artwork, but not totally. It's just feel like a cleaning, you know, brushes after you finish or, or beginning of it, you're preparing, you know, what you're going to work with it. So uh, I don't, when I work, I don't, I totally uh, zoned out what I do at that moment. Other than that, I cannot keep working, doing same thing over and over, but that's me. Um, I can do it. And the time you said, you know, John said, you know, archaeology, all of those amazing stuff. I, you know, when I was little, I want to be, I want to, I want to, I want to live in Egypt forever to dig all those sites because there's time we weren't there, but amazing history of our time back there. I was so stunning for reading all of this stuff. So every time we go out, me and Jim, we are looking for stuff like, you know, dinosaur spawns oh first of all they, even though there's a tiny piece i get so so i can cry with this guy and who is this guy and why it's here you know that kind of thing so um the one place i went there it's really struck me but it's uh, it's about it's all about time it's a bristol uh, cone pine forest or national park i don't remember there is pine tree it's a literally living the longest living thing is 4,000 years old. They have, they're still living on that, you know, very brutal area and they don't grow up straight because it's just so windy and cold. So they just coiled it and go to the ground and lower, but one branch is still alive. And then I asked them, you know, you know, they have, uh, I read it read about like visitor center and that is like 6,000 years old and living pine tree. How amazing is that? And after that, you know, I just, I just have to feel it. I just have to bring it into my work. And that's why I started to twist it, that twisted series after I saw this amazing, you know, the pine tree. And I feel like you know, still again, nature is very innocent. It, it's, it can be destroyed very easily by human or weather, but John said, they're still there, however. So that's what I really appreciate about all the timeline. You know, and I, I think it's interesting just to also reflect, you know, it, it doesn't have as long a horizon as the earth, but in some ways I think we all engage with art because we have some sense of it existing beyond our own lifetime and, you know, I hopefully sending some kind of message out to the future um, about what we were thinking about, you know, what our values were and, you know, what we saw as beautiful. So, you know, again, not, um, not as maybe monumental in scale as uh, this kind of geological or time, but certainly art and civilization has to do with that topic as well. So I know, Julia, that this is sort of the moment that we had set aside for um, other questions. Uh, you know, I have a few more, but I'm wondering if there's anyone in the audience who has a question that they want to interject right now. 
Um, I'll ask a question quick from um, one of our audience members here that was posted in the chat, um, and then we can turn back to your quest questions, Kristen, since we do still have um, a little bit of time left. Um, so I have a question from Brendan Robinson to both of the artists here. Um, it seems as though the force of water, earth, nature, and gravity is essential to both artist processes and materials. Do you feel like your work is also political and promoting environmental sustainability? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, as I mentioned that I don't put that much flair into my work direct, but definitely, you know, we have a lot of budget cut of, you know, we, do, we have shrinkage, shrinkage of national park. And the last time, last place I went to uh, Escalante, that place is going to be drilled a hole and they, it's going to be so messy. And that is amazing place. It is, it is treasure. We shouldn't be touch it. So that's why I did make an installation for Escalante. So definitely I do have political message behind my work, but not directly on my work but when you see and enjoy or think a little further in one step forward. You can, I, I hope you can see it as like John's work. Yeah, I would say the same thing, that, it's, that my work isn't overtly uh, political, but the idea is to get people to stop and slow down and appreciate the, the environment and what we have. And through that, uh, that somehow will slow down what's going on. And the, and, the, and the various havoc that's going on right now and, and to pay attention and, and maybe try to believe science. <laughs> There's some good science out there that I think could be followed. Thank you. Um, and I just want to call attention to one um, other thing that I see in the chat, um, which I believe is more of a comment, but I'll read it out for those of you who can't see the chat window. Um, there is a contemplative exercise to paper to understand everything that went into the formation. The tree, sun, water, atmosphere, time, soil, the list goes on, including the artists, the people who went into the process of forming the paper is an incredibly powerful meditation. Just a simple thing is not so simple. Um, so thank you, David Carlson, for that thought. Um, I believe we probably have maybe time for one more question. Question, Kristen, if you want to ask one more. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I, th I hope it's been clear <laughs> that John and Jay and I have known each other for a long time. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back, at, you know, to when I first met you both. But um, what I'm interested in is, is sort of your perspective on the last decade or two of your work and is there something that you're making today that you would never have anticipated making you know in the 90s um i'm i'm just curious about sort of the sense of continuity in your work or if there have been some surprising departures for you as artists uh and maybe jay do you want to go first on this one sure um i went back to you know this time since we are uh, you know, sheltering our place, I went back to uh, my sketchbooks about 30 years and I have a piles of sketchbooks I revisited. And uh, you know, I thought about your question about you know, what you said. And each work has their own story and uh, each work has their own life. So I but you know, I'm still working on those different series of work because some work I revisited and I haven't done and I don't I couldn't understand that time and then now I have time so I can start to do it. But um, as you as your question, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it's it's scale this day and age scale of my work changed. And when time passed and time being and, you know, 30 years back there and compared to right now, I do get less fear and I get more stubborn what I do. So 
I'm trying to, and I don't get less fear about a physical, you know, I don't really want to think about it, even though, you know, we all have problem with that, but it's a museum scale installation is, uh, you know, big, biggest departure for me and the scale, I don't get, I don't get scared anymore than when I was 30, 20. So that changed my, you know, view of my own art. So it is, it is interesting. Should, should get smaller, but it gets bigger. I don't know why. <laughs> I can't wait to see what you're doing in the next 20 years. It's yeah, huge. exactly. <laughs> the weight doesn't scare anymore. The, the, and, and scale doesn't scare anymore. So I think I'm good to go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and how about you, John? I mean, has there been a sort of unexpected or unanticipated leaps in your work? Or, you know, is it, is it kind of a continuous uh, trajectory from where you were to where you are now? Yeah, I, I think, you know, most artists, I think, cycle and recycle and revisit. So even, even though you might be working in a different medium or, 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 or different scale, there's still that thread that kind of ties it all back together. I think if you look at my work, if someone sees the chain link pieces and the castings, it's like, well, these are two different artists. But the fact that I did them proves that that's not right. <laughs> so it, it's like different ways of thinking, uh, inspired by different aspects of the material, but I think there's this that core thread of investigation and working with nature and industrial materials that has always been this kind of constant. Um, but there are, I think technology has, has opened up options for me that I didn't think I would have, like working with digital media, video, and sound that's become very accessible to the layman. <laughs> uh, you don't need a huge uh, studio to figure it out. It's all on your computer. And maybe the help from a young brain <laughs> to navigate the, the business. Um, but the other part I feel is that the, I see it as little chapters in a bigger work. And the, um, for example, back to the UNBC show, that was a, a large span of time with all these different kind of projects that I've been working on. The most recent being the, uh, the magnetite, the magnets and things in the other room and working with sound and, and combining those things together. And then uh, also the uh, seismic monitor. Those were all new avenues that I hadn't done before that were brought into that exhibition. Um, so I just see it as, as a constant evolution and, and bringing the different things that I'm thinking about together. That's what I really enjoyed about that exhibition is it wasn't about the singular, it was about a bigger idea and, a, and maybe a, a collection of things that I'm thinking about. And each one, I think it was like the synergy was beyond the single object as you navigated through the space. Great. Well, thank you both so much for sharing so much with us. And um, I know I look forward to getting back into each of your studios, hopefully sooner rather than later. So with that, I'll turn it back to Julia. Awesome. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks to the audience for your good questions and comments. Thank you to Kristen's mother for joining us too. That's so amazing. Um, thank you to Kristen, John, and Jay for participating tonight. Um, as a reminder, um, this exhibition, Summer 20, features 14 artists. It's our 43rd annual group exhibition, um, and it's going to be on view through September 26th. We are taking guests into the gallery. Um, you just have to come knock on our door. We're here Tuesday through Saturday, 11 to 5. Um, if you prefer to call ahead to make sure you're the only patrons in the gallery, um, you're welcome to do so. But thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, it's good to see so many familiar faces and names of our um, loyal patrons. So thank you so much. And this will be available to view um, 
tomorrow if you want to watch it again, which is great. It'll be posted on our website. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jay. <laughs> Bye, Barbara. Oh, okay. Me. Bring them in. I will. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, oh, look at that. Hey. There's David. Hello, David. <laughs> Kristen. David. Jay. Thank you, John. Thanks from afar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good, David. David. I, yeah, I live with both of you in, in my house, so I feel good about it. <laughs> you, do, you do look very happy down there, for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Jay, I still have some repair work to be done on that piece, though. So we'll, we'll, it, I'm waiting it out. Okay? I didn't damage my work. You're moving.